Good morning. Moms, I am with you. Happy Mother's Day. It is a treat to be here today to get to share with you from one mom to another in the thick of it, in the trenches. I'm excited to, to get to be with you today to share what I believe God's placed on my heart in regards to parenting. So we're in the middle of a hashtag winning series. Pastor Chris kicked it off with talking about worship two weeks ago. And then last week, Pastor Charlie talked about marriages. And then this week we thought, what more fitting of a day to talk about parenting. So hashtag winning at parenting. And I have to say, when I look at that title, it's a little daunting to me as a mom because I don't always feel like I'm winning at parenting. I'm the only one, right? Anybody else? You all are winning at parenting. <laughs> no, but I have a 10-year-old little girl and a 7-year-old little boy. They're sitting on the front row this morning. They're excited to, to be able to do that today. But I, I'm just not always winning. How many of you can relate to this? If, if 30 minutes before your son's baseball game, finding his dirty uniform uh, crumbled up in a heap on the floor from the last game. I mean, it, right, thank you, Becky. I knew you would relate. Or you know, I was thinking about this. I'm just going to just clear the air and get it all out this morning. And my daughter was in an after-school club a few weeks ago, and the topic of it was acting. And the whole point of this after-school club was that they were going to write their own play, assign their own characters, do their character development, and then the last day of the club, they were going to perform it for all the parents to come. And so this was something that she was just loving. She, every Wednesday when I would pick her up, she shared with me everything that they were doing and that they were working on. And I was so excited to be able to come on the last day and see the fruit of their labor and celebrate that with her. So I was prepared. I was ready. I arranged my schedule to make sure I could leave the office in time to be there. And I even got to the school 10 minutes early before I needed to be, which is a big deal. Uh, for somebody who tends to run late. And I, and I was excited to celebrate this with her. Well, if you have kids in Williamson County Schools, you know that there is a fairly new policy that they are very strict about, which is that you cannot enter the school unless you have your driver's license in your hand. Okay. You have to show it on the video camera before you go in the door. Okay. So I wait in my car, have a little downtime, excited about what's coming up walk up to the door five minutes before the performance and realize that I do not have my license. And it might not have been quite so bad, except that the week before, no, you guys, the week before I had used my Costco card to get into the school and I promised the school secretary that I would never ever do that again, <laughs> that I would always have my license with me. And so, y'all, I had to turn around and go home to get my driver's license. I do not make it a habit of not having a driver's license on me. This was really a random freak thing that happened. Um, so I drive home as fast as I can. I get my driver's license. I come back to the school, get into the school, and as soon as I walk into the office, I see the program director coming in, and the way her face fell when I walked in, I knew that I had missed the program that my daughter and I were so looking forward to, her, her presenting and me watching. So I make the walk of shame down to the classroom where they're now celebrating with cake and walk in to find out that not only was my daughter the only one without a parent there, she also was the only one not dressed in pajamas for her part in the play that day. <laughs> Winning at parenting. <laughs> and I share that with you because I think if we were to take a minute to go around the room, all of you that have kids or you know have been through it already, every single one of us would have a story or multiple stories like that. And if you haven't, it's coming. Just get ready. <laughs> it's just real life. It just, it just happens. And obviously, so we've all been there at some point or another, and, and our kids will be okay. They're going to get through it. It's just real life. But when I look at what does it mean to win at parenting as a follower of Jesus, as a believer in Christ, I think the win for all of us is ultimately to raise purpose-filled adults who love and follow Jesus. And see, if, if you love and follow Jesus, it permeates. Everything. It changes everything in your life. If your kids grow up to love and follow Jesus, they look to him for their identity and their purpose. They can look to him for wisdom and major life decisions. It will change literally the trajectory of their life because they will have a godly wisdom that comes from knowing him. 
If they grow and if they love and follow Jesus, they can turn to him for strength in tough times. We all know it's going to happen. It's going to come as much as we want to, you know, keep them in our bubble and shield them from all the tough times. It's going to happen. And we want them to be prepared for that. And so if they love and follow Jesus, they can look to him for their strength and for their hope when those tough times come. And finally, they will love others. They will look outward at others differently if they love and follow Jesus. They will be agents of change for the greater good because he affects the way that they love and care for other people. Ephesians 5.1 says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. The win is to raise adults who follow after Jesus in thought and deed and word and in action. So as parents, our life's calling becomes consistently pointing them to him through the way that we raise them. And I, I just want to take a minute to just emphasize that so often, especially as moms, I think it's so easy for us to carry this burden, this load, this heavy load of fear and anxiety. And that is not God's heart for us. That's not God's heart for us to win in parenting. So we're going to talk about just a few things. This is going to be like some simple, practical things that I hope will be an encouragement to you as you walk your parenting journey with your kids that will release you from some of that pressure and that burden that it's so easy for us to pick up. The theme of the day is making the most of our time. Our key scripture is found in Psalms 90 verse 12, and it says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And that might not scream parenting scripture at first, but let me tell you why it does. From the moment your child is born, time starts moving. And it moves faster than we think. You know the saying, the days are long, but the years are short. How many of you have raised children already? I mean, is that true? It goes way faster than you think, right? So I brought this illustration with me today. This vase right here has 936 marbles in it hand counted, 936, and it represents one week of your, uh, it represents every weekend that you have with your child in your home from the time they're born to the time that they turn 18, of 936 weekends. And every week, it's a visual countdown, a lot of parents use this, that so you may have been familiar with this before, but every week you take one marble out, and that's what you have left. And it's important because when you see how much time you have left, you tend to do more with the time you have now. This jar <laughs> is how many weeks Mike and I have left with our 10-year-old daughter at home. I still feel like I have little kids. <laughs> like I still, but we're, we're over halfway through. That's sobering. I shared this at one of our kids' trainings a while back, and one of my mom friends and I were talking about it later, and she said she kind of felt guilty because, you know, you don't always want to be with your kids 24-7. Let's just be real. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> but there is, I mean, so I wanted to clarify. This isn't about being helicopter mom 24-7, make your life feel like Disney World type of being intentional with our time. It's looking at the holistic picture of what we're doing and raising our kids and what is best for them. What, how do we make the most of these 936 weeks that we have? For some of you, being intentional about that is leaving the kids with grandparents and going off for a weekend away to work on your marriage, to reconnect with your spouse so that you can model that for them. For some of you stay-at-home moms in the thick of it, the best thing you can do is take a girl's weekend away sometimes and just remember who you are in Christ so that you can be refreshed when you come back home to parent them. You can write that in your notes. She said take a girl's weekend away. I would write that out. Anyways. <laughs> but so it's all about being intentional with the time that we have for the overall purpose of what we want to do. Because when you see how much time you have left, you tend to do more with the time you have now. It changes the way that you, that you um, spend your time, that you plan your day. When you're intentional with your time, when you're thinking about how much time you have, you might leave work early more often. It, it changes how you spend your Saturdays, driving your kids to school, helping them with their homework, tucking them into bed, going to church together as a family. It affects all of those things. When you remember you're, the days with your kids are numbered, you will tend to make a better plan. So we pray, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. So I came up with just a few things that I think will help us, I hope will help practically do this. And it's not 
a guarantee that your kids are going to come out well, okay? But I think that if we can focus on these things and then ultimately, like Pastor Charlie said, partner up with the Holy Spirit, he's driving the ship. Number one, look, intentionally evaluate your calendar. Although it is sobering to think about our time being limited, it also has the potential to be incredibly motivating, a motivating reminder that we have a specific amount of time to make it count. Ephesians 5, 15 through 16 says, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time. Now, if you were here a few weeks ago, one of Pastor Charlie's pastor friends came in and spoke, and he talked about the plimsoll line on a boat. And the plimsoll line is a mark on a, ship's, on a ship's hull that indicates the maximum depth to which the vessel may be safely immersed in the water when it's loaded with cargo. And if the boat is overloaded, then the plimsoll line goes below the water. And at that point, if the plimsoll line goes below the water when it's loaded with cargo, the ship becomes difficult and dangerous to navigate, and it ultimately will lead to its capsizing and sinking. I believe that there is a plimsoll line on every family's calendar. There is a place where you reach in your calendar where you can just tell that you or your spouse or your kids are just struggling from overload. And it's our calling as our parents to be intentional with our time and to make sure that we are spending our time on the right things. See, everything that we say yes to, we're saying no to something else. So it's important that we make sure that we're saying yes to the right things and that we're not overloading ourselves and our family because, you know, in this day and time, in this area especially, we are busy people. And busyness itself is not a sin. But let's make sure that we're not letting the time pass us so fast that we look back and realize we've missed out on some important things. So I put together a few questions I think are helpful in evaluating our calendar in light of what we're trying to do. Number one, have I said yes to too many things? Is the load that I'm carrying too heavy because I've taken on too much? And the answer might be yes. Yes, you have. It's time to you know, shift the cargo and do something different. But it might be God may remind you in this tender way that he does that no, I've just called you to do hard things right now, but I will lead you through it. This is a season. See, only you, through the directing and guiding of the Holy Spirit, can determine if that's the season you're in. There are times that it's, it, you have to go all out and you have to sacrifice for the betterment of your family's future. But let's be intentional to make sure that we know when that time is up and when it's time to pull back the reins. Okay, so second thing, does our calendar reflect our values and the values we want to instill in our kids? What does the way we spend our time tell our kids what is important in life? You know the saying, actions speak louder than words. The way we spend our time speaks volumes to our kids about what is important in life and what we value. So when we look at our calendar and we're evaluating it, does it tell our kids what's important. What is it telling them? It's telling them something. Is it telling them what we want them to pick up? And then once we evaluate our calendar and do our best to prioritize it, I think it's important that we decide how we can best utilize our schedule to pour into our kids. If you get the Gateway Kids monthly newsletter, I hope it's a lot of you if you have kids, but if you get it, there's a section in there under the theme of the month that has conversation starters and that has... Um, just discussion ideas that you can incorporate in drive times, meal times, bedtime, and for some of the younger ones, bath time. Just little ideas in the, to spark conversation, to get in your kid's head, to get, hear what they're thinking, to talk about what they're, you're talking about at church or what's going on at school. And it's just a great way to incorporate that into the daily rhythm of our life because if you start doing that, it becomes just the culture of your family. It becomes normal for you to have those kind of conversations, and it's not something else that you have to do on a list. It's not a burden that you have to carry because it's happening during these times that you have. You may have time where you're sitting in the car waiting for a game to start, eating fast food. That's the time that you can use to pour into your kids. On Wednesdays, if you follow Gateway Kids on Facebook, every Wednesday we have a mealtime conversation starter just to get you talking as a family and, and to have that. And then on Fridays, we post a scripture to read about, to read together at bedtime, which is another time that you can really intentionally connect with your kids. So we intentionally evaluate our calendars. Then we ask ourselves, 
how we can utilize our schedule to best pour into our kids. And the next way I believe that we can set ourselves up to win at parenting and making the most of the time we have is by intentionally talking and listening to them. We go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 through 7. It says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. Now, so being in children's ministry, I read a lot of studies on childhood development and childhood psychology and Modern day studies over and over and over again will tell you that one of the most important things that you can do as a parent is simply have conversations with your kids, simply talking to them. And what I love about God's word is these are the modern day studies that are saying that, but we can look at Deuteronomy, which was written over 2,000 years ago, and that's exactly what he's telling us to do. We should talk with our kids. When we rise, when we, when we lie down, when we sit, when we walk along the way, it's like he knew something. I mean, it's, it's just cool. It's just a cool thing about God's word. He knows. But <laughs> the reason is that no one has greater influence over a child than their parent. Celebrities have influence. Athletes have influence. But no one has greater influence over their life than their parent. So it's important that we take our responsibility serious, that we teach them. We can't outsource it. We can't outsource our influence. So it's important that we do that. Now, we're not going to always have all the answers. We're not going to be the expert. But through getting involved in church, through um, helping them find godly friendships, through helping pair them up with youth leaders and small group leaders and pastors, you can, you can set them up for success in that way. So we're intentional about keeping the lines of communication open, and it starts young. Parents, if I can just encourage you for a minute, if you listen to your kids talk about the small stuff, then when the big stuff comes along, they will be more likely to bring it to you. If you are regularly conversing with them and you're listening to them talk about what they want to talk, talk about, then the big, scary talks don't have to be so big and scary because it's already a part of your relationship. It's already normal, a part of the culture of your home and your family. Colossians 4, 6 says, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. When we're talking about inten being intentional about talking with our kids, you know, I thought about this scripture and it, sometimes, our, it, sometimes ourselves and our own family members are the most difficult people to show grace to. Am I right? Like, who's the ones you snap at first, right? Or who are you hardest on the most? And it, this, but this scripture tells us to let our conversation be full of grace and seasoned with salt. The difficult conversations are going to come. You may not know this, but your kids are imperfect people, just like us, just like you, right? They're imperfect. I'm imperfect. We're imperfect. The difficult conversations are going to come, but it's important that we remember to temper our responses with grace and truth. If, you were, if we are yelling at them or lashing out at them anytime they come to us or we're ignoring them or dismissing them when they want to tell us about something little, then the chances are that when something big comes along, they're not going to bring it to us. But if you're having regular conversations with them or listening to them tell you about your sci their science project for the 10th time in a row and where, you know, you have this open door policy where they can come to you and they know that they're going to be loved no matter what, there's going to be grace and truth. I'm not talking about no discipline. That's a whole nother sermon. Okay, but there's grace and truth. They're going to be more likely to come to you, and you have a greater chance to speak into their lives and have influence. The third way I believe we can be intentional about making the most of the time that we have is by intentionally connecting with our kids. And this is the fun one. Psalms 127 verse 3 says, Children are a heritage from the Lord, a reward from him. Kids are a reward, and a reward is something to be enjoyed. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. So does anybody need to be reminded of that? <laughs> it's a good thing. <laughs> Some of you are laughing, so I thought you might need that reminder. <laughs> Although we have the responsibility in raising them, we also have this amazing privilege to enjoy them. We can enjoy their personalities. We can laugh with them. 
Kids bring so much joy. So often when I'm praying with my kids at night, I let them hear me thank God for the amount of joy that they bring to our house and our family. And I want them to know that, I want them to hear and know that they are cherished and loved, but it is important that kids feel a sense of belonging to their family. They need to know that they're, they need to know that they have a unique place in their family unit that no one else can fill, each one of them. And one of the ways we can do that is by simply figuring out what they like and either joining in on that with them or cheering them on. I remember when our son Brooks was a toddler, one of the ways that Mike connected with him was every day when he got home from work, they wrestled. And Brooks could not wait for Mike to get home from work because he could not wait to tackle daddy. That's like the pinnacle of his day was to tackle daddy. And they connected on that. You know, not only do boys have a lot of aggression and energy that they just need to like get out. So we accomplished that. But it also just made Brooks feel important and loved that his daddy would drop his work stuff and just get on the floor and spend time doing what he loved most, which was wrestling. So whatever it is, think about your kids. I'm like any of you that have kids, whether they're grown up adults or babies, think about what it is that your kids like. God has made them so unique. He has put these interests in them. He's put so much goodness in them that's just waiting there to be discovered. And as their parent, you get to help them discover that. You get to help find that and pull that out and see it develop. So what do they like? What makes them tick? What do they just love? And then how can I be a part of joining in with them on that? Maybe you're coaching their baseball team or helping out, or maybe, you know, or maybe you're just cheering them on from the stands. Or another opportunity that we have as parents to connect with them is to think about what we are good at that we can teach them. What's the, do you have a hobby or a skill that you can connect with them on? But find a way that you can connect and have fun together. And then here's a favorite of mine. What can we celebrate together? Every celebration is a chance for us as a family to connect and enjoy each other. It's important that we celebrate as a family. Even the little things. Celebrate as much as you can. I was listening to a podcast with Lisa Turkhurst the other day. She was talking about this. And she had her grown adult daughters on with her. None of them live at home anymore. But one of the ways that they stay connected as a family is they have Monday night dinners. Every single Monday night, same place, same time, same people. They all come around the table and they have dinner together. I mean, some of this is just really simple stuff. But it's so impactful to our kids and to leading them and pointing them towards Christ. So maybe that's where you are today. Maybe you have grown children or older kids that are in their teens and it's hard to just get everybody in the same place at the same time. And you can say, this is our plan moving forward. Every you know, week or every month, we will consistently and steady be together no matter what's going on, intentionally connect. So to make the most of the time we have, we intentionally evaluate our calendars, we intentionally look for ways to connect. We intentionally talk regularly and listen. But before we can impart anything of value to our kids, it first has to be in us. See, kids are intuitive. They can tell if you're doing something just to check off a box, or they can tell if you're actually passionate and believe what you're talking about. So it's important. We, you know, we, can, we can teach them religious rules and principles, but principles without passion is hollow and it's empty. And it won't last. If we look back to Deuteronomy 6, verse 5 through 7, it says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words I command you today shall be on your heart. Before he ever gets to the teach them diligently, talk regularly, he says it needs to be on your heart. In, in Deuteronomy 11, a similar passage, and he says, fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. So how do we do that? Back to simple basics. Read, respond, and reflect to God's word every single day. The first step to being intentional about the time we have in raising our kids is to tend to our own spiritual growth and our own relationship with him. We can't do it without him. If you are a mom feeling like you are sinking right now, Call out to him. He's there. Get in the word. See what he has for you. This is not easy. It's not easy to be in the word regularly when you are in the thick of parenting. Amen? 
Amen. It's not. But I just want to encourage you today that as parents in the thick of it, we have an invitation, and I would even say a high calling to open the Word of God and be encouraged and strengthened by Him every single day to do exactly what we're called to do for that particular day. Every day that we do not open our Bibles, we are missing out on an opportunity to be encouraged and to be poured into by His Holy Spirit. When we read and we reflect and we respond to God's word, we're giving the Holy Spirit opportunity to speak into our hearts, to move into our minds, and to mold us into the person that he desires for us to be. And guess what, parents? If that's happening to you, guess who's on the front row watching it happen? It becomes normal for your kids to see you in the word daily. They see the fruit of the Spirit start to manifest in your life. They feel the atmosphere of your home shift. They might not be able to put their finger on it. They may not say, hey, you're really manifesting for the spirit today, mom. <laughs> but it's happening inside of them. It becomes normal. It becomes a byproduct. Just from, it's just flowing from you because you're first being strengthened in the word and being molded by the Holy Spirit. The second part, study the scriptures and seek out godly resources to know why you believe what you believe. And I put this in here because I believe that this is one of the single most important things that we can do as parents in the 21st century who are raising kids to follow Christ. Our kids are being exposed to more knowledge, more uh, different worldviews, opposing viewpoints than they ever had before at younger ages than ever before. So it's important for us as parents to know why we believe what we believe so that we can walk through some of that with them because it will come up. It will happen. And this doesn't mean, again, it's not means having all the answers, but it does mean not being afraid to have tough discussions about faith, not being afraid to sit down and talk about, does God really exist? Well, let's talk about it. Let's dig out the scriptures. Let's think through this together. And if you've already processed through all that in your mind, then it becomes that much easier to walk through that with them. It doesn't have to be scary or something that we can't talk about that we put up on a shelf. I highly recommend a parent blog called ChristianMomThoughts.com. It's by Natasha Crane. If you haven't heard of her, I encourage you to go buy her books, follow her blog. It does say Christian Mom Thoughts, but it's for moms and dads. Pastor Chris Dodd um, introduced me to her a couple years ago. And she's passionate about helping equip Christian parents with an understanding of common challenges to Christianity and how to address them with their kids. And it's a game changer. So seek out godly resources, study the scripture, know why you believe what you believe so you can walk through that with them when your kids get there. Finally, as we seek God in our daily lives, and this goes for every one of us, even if you're not a parent, when we're seeking God in our daily lives and we're surrendering to him, the Holy Spirit begins to refine us and change us. And when that happens, our kids have a front row seat to watch God at work. So when we start to be changed into the likeness of Christ, our kids get to see what that looks like. So I thought about how that actually plays out in daily life, and I wrote a few of these things down. I think it's beneficial and important for our kids to see it play out in our, in our giftings and our callings. I put, let them see you thrive in your giftings and callings. See, when kids see mom and dad excel at something that God has put in you, or they see you go after a goal and you crush it, or they see you work hard at something that God has called you to do, it inspires them and it instills in them confidence that they can do it too. So let them see you thrive in your giftings and callings. The second way is to let them see you trust and walk in faith. I thought back to when I was younger, both of my parents worked at a company in town that was the biggest employer in town. And there came a time when things were just modernizing and they needed to make a lot of cuts at the company. And this was the buzz in town. I was in elementary school, but I remember it was even in talk at school of like, we might have to move, my mom might lose her job, my dad might lose his job, you know, and there was just a, just a climate of fear and just being unsure. And one night at dinner, my dad just kind of told us, he said, you know, this is happening, they are cutting hundreds of jobs at the company, mom and I might lose our job, But our family will not walk in fear because God is our provider. And that was like the end of it. (laughs) And I went back to school and I was like, 
I mean, God's our provider, so, you know. But that just, I think back on it now, and I'm like, I think dad was probably, like, t- trying to talk to his own spirit and his own self, you know, to be, we're not going to walk in fear. But for me as a kid to hear that, gosh, I just walked on his coattails of that. We will not walk in fear. So it's important that we let our kids see some of those things. They don't need to know every problem and thing that's going on. But if they're aware of it, let them see you trust God and walk in faith. Make that declaration for your family. The final thing is let them see us make mistakes and repent. I just mentioned my dad, and I'm going to tell one more story about him. I was fortunate enough to have a very involved and loving dad growing up. So he's part of pretty much all of my childhood memories. I have a lot of wonderful memories of him. But one of the most impactful memories I have of my dad was when I was pretty little. My mom was working late one night, and my dad was running solo, trying to get my sister and I in bed. I don't know what I was doing. I was doing whatever kids do when you want them to go to bed, and they're not. Um, they're not doing it. And I remember he started to get really frustrated. He was losing his temper. And I don't remember what it was that he said other than I remember thinking, Dad is really mad, and I really need to get in bed right now. So I jumped into bed, and I fell asleep. And if that's where the story ended, I probably, it probably wouldn't have been very meaningful, and I wouldn't even be mentioning it now. But probably 30 to 45 minutes later, I remember all the lights were off except the hall light, and I remember my dad coming into my room, and he knelt down beside my bed, and he rubbed my hair. I remember waking up to hearing him say, Jenny, I'm so sorry, I lost my temper with you. You weren't doing anything wrong, and I'm sorry. And y'all, I just curled up and fell right back to sleep, feeling like the most loved and cherished, important little girl in the whole wide world. So I want to encourage you with that today. And Sebastian, you can come on up. I want to encourage you with that today. Bad moments don't make bad parents. They don't. Bad moments don't make bad parents. You're going to have plenty of them. I have plenty of them. My parents had plenty of them. It's what we do coming out of that. How do we model humility and forgiveness and repentance for our kids? Because then guess what? When I grew up and I had my babies and I lost my temper, guess what my first inclination was to do? To go back in there and apologize because it had been modeled for me. Never buy into the myth that you need to become the right kind of parent before God can use you. That is a lie. It is not true. God doesn't use perfect pictures. He uses broken people. So if you are at a point, if you are, you have an opportunity to cooperate with what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life and in your kids' lives and in your family's life. And I want to invite you to walk in that today. My final thought is that um, I wanted to share with you a Latin phrase that comes from Psalms 127. It simply says, Nisi Dominus Frista. It's on the city of Edinburgh, Scotland's coat of arms. And it simply means this, without the Lord, frustration. And it comes from Psalms 127 where it says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. We can read the best of the best parenting books. We can talk to our mom friends day in and day out. We can read all the blogs. We can listen to all the podcasts. But unless we invite the Lord in, at the very least, it will end in frustration. If we don't surrender to the Lord every single day, invite his Holy Spirit into our homes and into our parenting, then we open ourselves up to parent out of fear and anxiety and control and striving and comparison. And friends, that's just not God's heart. That's not his heart for you or for me. So if y'all will stand today. If you still have kids at home over these next few minutes, just take some time to ask the Lord how you can better number your days as parent. Take some time in this moment to ask him to show you where there is give and where there is room for him to move in your family's life. Maybe you have a child that you've not been spending time with connecting and you just know, like God's putting them on your heart right now. I need to spend time with them. I need to find a way to better connect with them. No matter how old they are, adult, 
kid, baby, then this is God's invitation to you today to begin doing that. Or maybe your calendar needs some rebooting and your cargo load needs shifting. Maybe you need to go on a date night with your spouse and say, let's check out our calendar. Let's make sure that it's imparting the values into our kids that we want to share to them, that it's telling them that the right things are important in life. Or maybe today is the day that you come back to tending to your own relationship with him. And if so, he gently says to you, come, today is the day. Maybe you've been filled with anxiety as a parent and you're struggling to entrust your kids to the Lord. Or maybe you're parenting from a place of fear or codependency. Today's the day you need to invite the Holy Spirit into your parenting and entrust your kids to him. Over these next few moments, whatever it is, wherever you find yourself on your parenting journey, let the Holy Spirit meet you there and carry the burden and guide your thoughts and actions moving forward. It is not too late. Whether you have this many marbles in the jar, you have this many marbles in the jar, or some of you have this many marbles in the jar, you're in your final days of them being at home. It is not too late. And if your children are gone and out of the house, it is not too late too late. Spend some time reconnecting with them. Spend more time than ever on your knees for them, praying for them, lifting them up, inviting the Holy Spirit into your family, into your culture. Let's pray, to, let's pray together today. Holy Spirit, thank you for the way that you come into our lives, that you come into our homes. Thank you for your word, Lord, that we can hear from you, God, that we can get practical instruction to hear your heart. And thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that comes alongside that, Lord, to help us walk in grace and in truth. Thank you for your wisdom that you give us. And I pray for every parent here that you would give them a heart of wisdom in parenting. I pray that you would reveal to parents today what steps they can take, Lord, how you want to move in their family, Lord, in pointing our kids to you. I pray that moms, especially today, would just be encouraged in you, Lord. May we never miss an opportunity to open your word and to hear from you and to receive from you. I pray blessing and encouragement over every parent in this room. May we move forward boldly in the calling that you have placed on our lives as parents. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you are a guest that's worshiping with us today, thank you for joining us. We're honored that you've chosen to worship with us. Please make sure to stop by the Connect Center. There's a Connect card in the seat back pocket in front of you. If you fill that out and drop it by the Connect Center, we have a gift that we'd like to give you. We'd like to get to know your name. Don't forget to stop by the Mother's, uh, the Mother's Day photo booth outside and get a family picture. And um, yeah, thank you for being here. I love y'all. I'm praying for you in your journey as parents. Let's now for the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you. Be gracious to you and grant you peace. And you're rising up and in your laying down and you're going out and you're coming in both now and forevermore. Amen. Hey, don't, don't leave this. I don't do this often. One, I'll say that our staff is gold. <laughs> our staff here is gold. And you are a, you are a gift. Hard, hard week, a lot of struggles this week you've had to fight through. But I'll tell you, at the end of that message specifically, wow, the Holy Spirit was thick in here. And what I want to remind you of is by Wednesday, all these messages are on the Facebook or on our group page. All the notes are there, okay? They're all there on actually on our website. There was some unbelievable stuff today, but when you said bad moments don't make bad parents, wow. And with, without God, frustration, wow. Wow. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming today. Amen.